Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I am delighted to have Brian McVeigh back. Uh, today, we're gonna to be combining two of his interests, Julian Jaynes and Japan. We've been doing incredible series of meetups with Julian Jaynes. I'm gonna put the uh, link to the playlist in the chat. So if you're not familiar with Julian Jaynes, go ahead and go through that because we are trying to make ideas of Julian Jaynes accessible to anybody. These are profound ideas and we wanna make them accessible. That's what we're doing. So today we're gonna to be talking about the intersection between Julian Jaynes and Japan. So take it away, Brian. Okay, uh, thank you, Shurkan. And thank you everybody for uh, joining us today. So uh, just let me preface, uh, what I'm going to say, uh, today's talk um, is actually uh, based on a book. Well, actually, I, I composed the talk years ago, and it came out in a book several years ago. So I don't mean to push my book, but if anyone is interested in a more detailed uh, analysis, um, please, it, it is in paperback. It's not uh, not too expensive for an academic book. So let me begin. I'm going to uh, just call something up. I'm going to share. Uh, okay. So can everyone see that? Okay. Yep. Okay. So the emergence of psychotherapies in modern Japan, a Jamesian interpretation. So just let me introduce a few themes that I'll be uh, uh, focusing on today. The first is intensification of consciousness or conscious interiority over the centuries. And again, if, if you're new to Jane's, th th this may seem a little bit abstract, but uh, in any case, I think my talk, uh, uh, it, I, I think what's important about it is that most people, when they hear Jane's or think of Jane's, if they're familiar with Jane's, they just think of ancient societies. But in this talk and in my research, I'm trying to show that what Jane said actually has relevance for all times, including modern times. And I'm trying to take Jains out of the Middle East and Egypt uh, and ancient Greece, because when people think of Jains, of course, that's where that he, he used those as examples to make his arguments. But I'm trying to show that Jains has global relevance. So just let me uh, mention this. We've talked in the past before about the use of metaphors, we'll encounter this theme uh, today. And uh, of course, this is a universal, uh, this process, how we use internal organs, whether it's the heart, stomach, liver, to describe where psychological events occur. Of course, psychological events do not occur in real space. Um, and that's why we have to use metaphors. And so we know what a me metaphor is basically to describe the unknown by using something known. In other words, to use uh, uh, internal organs. And in the case of China and Japan, well, actually, I, I, most ma many societies, there's nothing unusual about this, the, the use of heart. And in, in the typical Japanese dictionary, heart will prefix over 200 words. And so the idea here, this is an example of a metaphor, how we have an easy time describing our sensations, but when it comes to difficult uh, abstract concepts, we have to rely on something like the heart. So in Japanese, heart is pronounced shin or kokoro. It can be uh, related in meaning to motivation, idea, mentality, feeling, attention, interest, mood, uh, will. And in fact, the word in modern Japanese for psychology is shinrigaku, which literally means the study of the principles of the heart. And this word did not exist in Japanese until the, light, the, until the late 19th century. So that's an important point to keep in mind. So the other thing I wanna to do today's talk is historically contextual, contextualize how modernization changed Japan's view of what it means to be a person specifically uh, from a psychological uh, perspective. And what's interesting about Japan is that, you know, people assume, well, it's an Asian society. They must have a very different view 
of what we call psychology in the Euro-American tradition. But the fact is, if you study carefully the evolution of psychology as a field in the 19th century in Japan, you'll see that in many ways, it followed a similar trajectory as it did in the Euro-American tradition. There are, of course, local cultural differences and inflections, but the important point I'm making is that psyche or the human mind responded to modernity in the same manner in Japan. And I'll give some examples of that in a moment. And uh, the other thing I wanna talk about today is looking at uh, what James called bicameral vestiges. And a good example uh, of that, of course, is hypnosis. So if there's any truth to Jane's arguments, we have to find global patterns. If you cannot find the same global patterns, then Jane'sian psychology as an explanatory paradigm does not work. So that's why I'm looking at, for example, um, uh, bicameral vestiges. So in Japan, beginning in the late 19th century, uh, Japan, the Japanese researchers attempted to disentangle the study of what we call mind from mysticism, pseudosciences, and religion. That is not that different from what happened in the Euro-American tradition. I want to emphasize that. If you look at the beginnings of psychology as a modern research field, it's not that in, in the Euro-American tradition, it's not that different from how it developed in Japan. And the last point, introductory point I want to make is very important. So the argument I'm making is that changes in society, such as industrialization, as societies become more complex, more technologically advanced, will change human psychology, will somehow alter the human mind. And, the, and part of that argument is that the invention of academic psychology resulted from changes in the human mind. And sometimes I say, say that to people and they kind of scratch their head, you know, what does that mean exactly? But um, in any case, hopefully that point will become more clear as we go on. So intensification of consciousness. So if you remember, we talked a lot about um, what I call the features of consciousness in previous talks. Consciousness is just a, it's a toolkit of cognitive capabilities that developed about 3000 years ago. Uh, these are listed here. We don't have to go into detail discussing these, but um, in any case, what does this mean, intensification of consciousness? The, what I'm arguing is that consciousness as a psychological process accelerated in late 19th century Japan, as it did in other places around the world. So that's an important point, keep in mind. So this chart is an attempt to explain, uh, it was sort of to present uh, in grand historical terms, the intensification of consciousness. So on the bottom, you'll see a timeline, uh, the breakdown of the bicameral mind sometime before 1000 BCE, depending on what geographical area you look at. Then the emergence of conscious interiority about 1000 BCE. And then by the 19th century, all over the most places in the world that were industrializing, you had an intensification or an elaboration of consciousness. And that's what on uh, the, the features of consciousness uh, is how conscious people were. And the claim I'm making is that uh, by the, the late, 19th, late 19th century, uh, people became more conscious. And of course, again, that doesn't make much sense unless you're familiar with the particular features and aspects of conscious interiority. And we talked about that uh, before. I think there's probably about 12 or 13 different features of consciousness. So why did psychology appear when it did? Well, psychology, as the other social sciences, was an attempt to deal with huge economic developments caused by 19th century industrialization. It was an adapt adaptation to evolving social circumstances. And it was, a, it was an attempt to make the mind more scientific, to figure out a way to measure psychological processes. You know, remember, in the Euro-American tradition before the 19th century, some philosophers claimed, Kant claimed, for example, back in, in the uh, late uh, 1700s, that uh, there would never be a scientific psychology. You cannot measure the mind. But by the late 19th century, 
people started to have a, a change of opinion about that. And there was an attempt to make everything scientific, including what we call the human soul. And we're still dealing with this whole issue, actually. How can we make the mind something that we ordinarily associate with some mysterious religious spiritual force? How can we make it scientific? The Japanese struggled with the same problem. So uh, I've already introduced this uh, metaphors of mind, all languages. So again, if, if James is going to make, if James theories have validity, the claim that all languages use metaphors to describe mental events must be true. And it is if you study the history of languages. And I make a distinction between what I call literal metaphors. So for example, in pre-modern times, psychological activities were believed to actually occur in one's heart, liver, bladder, kidneys, brain, etc. That's what literal metaphors uh, mean. But then, you know, more modern times, we, we use the, the term I use is figurative metaphors. So we do not really believe that mental activities take place in our organs, though we employ very useful figures of speech to describe cognitive, emotional, volitional acts as if they do. So in any case, that's just uh, has to do with uh, metaphors. So let's look at Japanese metaphor. What, what are some common metaphors of mind? As I said, the most important one is heart, uh, but there are some other uh, examples, uh, chest, uh, belly, head, eye. Um, and the most important, actually probably the most important one is the last one, key. And we, I've mentioned this in several of my talks before. So uh, to kind of change subject a little bit, as psychology developed in the 19th century in Japan and in other industrializing uh, societies, it borrowed concepts from religion. And so the same idiom used to describe mental events was utilized to discuss the supernatural. And, and that there's nothing, again, this is sort of a universal, it's kind of an interesting question. Why is that the case? So both psychological and religious concepts refer to difficult to define mysterious, strange entities, okay? Uh, that's what they share in common. And that's why uh, for many years in the Euro-American tradition uh, before the late 19th century, people would use the word mind and soul interchangeably. In, uh, philosophers and the early psychologists would use those words interchangeably because they were having a hard time trying to separate a scientific psychology from religious ways of thinking. So modern scientific secular definitions of mind um, are built upon pre-modern, pre-scientific religious meanings. This is true uh, all, all over the world. There's nothing particularly Japanese about that, but it's worth looking at some examples um, from Japan. So universal process, uh, so bodily organs, natural phenomena, religious entities are metaphorically pressed into service to represent what we now call mind or mental events. Uh, so a Japanese word that illustrates the religio-spiritual roots of the psychological is the word uh, seishin. Now this is used in a wide range of terms. And please note how the same word seishin can mean things that are psychological, psychiatric, medical, religious, and spiritual. So you can see uh, a sort of, uh, they, they had a difficult time disentangling, all, all languages do have a difficult time disentangling the psychological from uh, the spiritual. So what seishin, if you break this word down into its component parts, Say can mean spirit, ghost, fairy, energy, vitality, purity, something hidden, uh, quintessential nature. And then shin means God, deity, soul, divine, sacred. But combined, it, say shin is often used to refer to something, as I said, uh, psychological. I, I, say shin often means mind, actually. So for another example, so the word uh, shin, gods, it, it appears in, in the Japanese word for nerves, shinke. And so literally that term, if you look at it, it means something like 
the the sheen or the spiritual energy gods whatever passes through right passes through your body and this word actually um shinke means so anything neurological or your neurology and so that's what neurology is translated as, as, as Shinke Gakko. So these are just some examples showing you how the most modern words are still grounded in very ancient uh, metaphors. So let's uh, change uh, topic a little bit here and talk about the origins of Japanese psychotherapies. So there was a, what we might call a proto-psychotherapy in Japan. Um, I mean, typically it meant like in most places in before the late 19th century, mental illness was described as either something supernatural where you would need a, sh a shaman or some sort of religious procedure to take care of uh, whatever ailed you. And, and or it was a mental illness, actually, uh, in a way, they're a little bit modern. They would view it as a, a medical physiological problem. But this is the point that's uh, important. There really was no what we would call psychological explanation of mental illness before the 19th century in Japan. It was either supernatural or it was medical. Well, the, the, this, this slide uh, uh, recaps what I just said. So there was no third realm of the psychological, neither spiritual nor medical, 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 physical. So this idea of what I call conscious interiority, or what James called mind space, simply was not as developed as it is today. And so these are just some words, some uh, terms that they uh, Japanese before modern times would use uh, to describe um, what might be manifested as what we call a mental uh, illness. Uh, as you can see, they before the 19th century, they wrote about epilepsy, madness, what they called fright disorder, uh, heart mind disease. Uh, actually, some of these words are a little bit uh, newer, but um, but in any case, just to give you an idea that there was a rather complex attempt to explain what we call mental illness, but it was not done using a psychological mindset, which sounds very strange and counterintuitive, I think, uh, for people. But in any case, um, so these are some of the treatments that they would use uh, to try and help people who were suffering from uh, mental illness. Okay, so here's this word again, key. We've talked a lot about this before. Um, this was a central concept that can, depending on the context, it might mean spirit, mind, or heart. It's used in many, many words. And uh, so key might be translated as something, uh, a vitalistic ethereal energy, infusing, unifying the cosmos, natural processes, body, soul. And for those of you who are familiar with Japanese martial arts, uh, Aikido, that's that, that, that uh, that that that's that key as you can see there uh so some more examples of, li of what we would call literal metaphors remember some time ago i made a distinction between literal and figurative metaphors so um chinky mean mind uh, and that, the, if, you, if you see the japanese the uh, if you if you see the ideograms the, for Shinki, of course, the first one is heart. And then the second uh, ideogram means something like God or some sort of mystical energy. For uh, Seiki, divine spirit, Shinki, vital spirit, Seiki. So, some of these words are used in modern Japan. Uh, so, some, some of them are not. But I'm, I know that this is maybe a little difficult to put together if you're not familiar with Japanese. But I'm just trying to show how psychological idioms are built upon older concepts. So literal metaphors ensured that the psyche was not as psychologized as, is, as it is today. Again, that's a little difficult to uh, get your mind around perhaps, but an interior, interiorized psychological realm, uh, which clearly segregates uh, from both our physicality or divine natures was weakly developed in Japan. And I think that probably was true in most parts of the world, actually, before the 19th century. So psychological processes were conceived as somatic, concrete, almost visible events, 
So the idea, if someone was suffering from a mental illness, you know, the, the idea is if you were a shaman, you wanted to squeeze that, sp that evil spirit out of the person or maybe do some sort of primitive surgery and release, let, let the person bleed out perhaps or, or cut the person open and look for uh, what, whatever evil spirit there, uh, there was uh, in a person causing them uh, illness. Some believed in uh, what was what in J Japan is called fox possession and other superstitions. So being possessed by a fox is a very, very common theme in Japan. That goes back many, many centuries. Uh, so this is just, there's, there's something particularly Japanese about this idea of, of fox po possession, actually. So to skip uh, ahead a little bit. So let's talk about the, the modernization of Japanese psychotherapy. So, uh, yeah. so Brian, I want to give you feedback. This is fantastic. So this is just, just incredible material. So please take your time to, to make the, make, make the whole presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So the growth of psychotherapy in Japan, of course, must be understood within the context of massive changes in Japan that had to do with industrialization, Japan's attempt to keep the Western imperialist at bay and also to politically centralize Japan. In other words, Japan was experiencing a crash course in modernization. Most societies who try to modernize very quickly um, did not make it. Japan is unusual because it's one of the few countries that was able to modernize so uh, so quickly. So I give that as some background to understand how uh, psychology develops in Japan. So as psychological processes had to adapt to modernity, individual minds, individual psyches confronted new political economic demands and often would buckle under pressure because the changes were so fast. It's difficult for us to imagine. We think that things move quickly today, but in Japan, in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, things were moving uh, breakneck speed. And an attempt to deal with it, this, of course, was how to modernize uh, uh, what we today would call psychological uh, processes. So to look at things from, a, I suppose, a psychiatric point of view, two individuals did much to modernize treatment of Japan's mentally ill. Uh, Sakaki Hajime. Uh, he studied psychiatry in Germany. He was the first chair of psychiatry at Tokyo Imperial University School of Medicine and director of the Tokyo Public Asylum. He believed that mental illness is biological in origin and hereditary. hereditary. So he actually was, uh, of course, took a very scientific modern view of um, mental illness. And the reason why I introduced some of these names is to just make things a little more concrete um, so we don't uh, sort of have a, a vague idea of what was going on uh, in Japan at this time. Uh, another important uh, figure, Kure Shuzo, he is called the father of Japanese psychiatry, the Japanese Pane, uh, studied overseas uh, under uh, Emil uh, Krapelin and Franz Niesel. Uh, which of course were uh, very famous German and European uh, scholars. He trained a generation of Japanese mental health specialists. Uh, he established a Japanese neurological society in 1902. He founded a charity in, in the Cure Society for the Mentally Ill. Uh, and uh, he wrote with another individual the situation of mental patients confined in their homes and its statistical inspection. Now that was significant because at that time, if you had a member of your family who suffered from severe mental illness, basically you were responsible for keeping that person in your home. Uh, and of course it would take some time before the idea that mental illness is not a private family affair that, but is a public health issue uh, would take root in Japan. So some legislative landmarks in social in the social management of the mentally ill began in the early 1870s. And it was around that time that exorcism was outlawed. Okay, because as I said before, a lot of people 
when they were suffering from a mental illness, they were brought to a shaman or went to a temple or a shrine where a type of exorcism was practiced. So you can see things started to move very quickly in Japan. In 1900, the authorities um, passed the Mental Patients Custody Act. It allowed confinement of mentally ill patients by a family at home. Okay, so that, that they did not get rid of that yet entirely. Um, but the idea they at least wanted to give it uh, give that practice a stamp of approval. Uh, meant then in the, 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 the same year, uh, more legislation in 1919, mental illness asylum law was passed. So the, the change topics. Now let's talk about what James calls vestigial bicameriality. And again, if what James is saying is true, you have to find similar examples of vestigial bicameriality all over the globe. And so that's why I'm focusing on this in the case of Japan, to see if Jane's has legs. Does what Jane's say make sense in other parts of the world? So uh, psychology of the abnormal. So main, at that time in Japan, in fact, in the Euro-American tradition, mainstream research psychology was mostly focused on one mental state, what we might call waking consciousness. But as more specialists and experts attempted to understand what was normal, the more they begin to see odd and strange behavior. Same thing happened, of course, in the Euro-American tradition. And by the way, uh, that word there, uh, we're waking consciousness. So th this is why people have a difficult time understanding Jane's. Jane's did not specifically use waking consciousness, but he did use the word consciousness, of course. And for Jane's, when he used it, he was using it in this older, late 19th century sense. But the problem that we've talked about this before, when many people hear the word consciousness, for them, it can mean perception, it can mean cognition, it means all different types of things. But Jane's used it in a very specific sense. So that's more of a footnote, but I just wanted to mention that. And the way James was using it harks back to uh, the way psychologists in the 19th century used it. So when, when psychologists, many psychologists talked about consciousness in the late 19th century, they had something specific. But in the 20th and 21st century, consciousness has sort of exploded into this vague concept. And people use it in all sorts of ways, and it becomes very confusing. Um, but in any case, I just wanted to point that out. So uh, people became more interested in uh, the pathological and the transcendent, in other words, some spiritual. So spirituality, some people who studied spirituality were also studying psychology. Uh, so in a way, certain brands of clinical psychology overlapped with the paranormal, things like clairvoyance, telepathy, mediums, apparitions, dissociation, hallucinations, vivid mental imagery. So of course, hallucinations um, is I think very relevant for our, our discussion of Jane's. Um, so uh, what's important again to repeat, at around the same time in the Euro-American tradition, people started to become more interested in the paranormal and using psychology to explain the paranormal. So spiritualism in Japan or mediumship in Japan, of course, had a long history. Beliefs about ghost and shamanism had been around for centuries uh, in, in recorded Japanese history. And so, for example, uh, a form of divination, kokuri, it's something like the Ouija board. It's a little difficult to explain, but um, that again, if James is correct, you will find remnants of vestigial uh, bicameral uh, phenomena and d divination is one of them dream revelations, a big deal, prophetic visions. And then I've as mentioned before, being possessed by uh, foxes. Also people could be possessed by a snake or a tanuki. Uh, that's a picture of a tanuki there. Maybe, maybe some of you are familiar if you've been to Japan. A tanuki, it's something like a raccoon. Um, you see a lot of them, a lot of statues of them actually in urban Japan, usually out in, in front of bars. But the idea that you could be possessed by a tanuki uh, old beliefs were reinforced in the late in, in the late 19th and 20th century by the increasing popularity 
of spiritualism and occultism at the global level. So you had Japanese researchers who were interested in the occult communicating internationally with people in North America and Europe. So this, this interest in spiritualism really is very interesting. I think it was a reaction to the attempt by some psychologists to make the human mind more scientific. Some people wanted to hold on to these older religious ideas um, and, and study things like the paranormal. So you, you sort of had a, a tension between a scientific psychology and a type of psychology, as I said, that uh, uh, had more to do with uh, what some people might call pseudoscience. And many people attempted you know, to, to be a little more nuanced. Many researchers in Japan attempted to explain the spiritual by using science. And you still see that, of course, today. You know, whether that can be done or not, of course, I'm not gonna say, but um, you know, they, they would actually set up laboratories where they would try to explain being possessed by a fox or uh, some sort of spiritual uh, uh, phenomenon by using scientific methods. So at Kyoto Imperial University, the, there was a famous psychologist, uh, Imamura Shinkichi. And now he pursued studies in what we now call parapsychology. He set up Society for the Study of the Spirit, Society of the Mind, Spiritual Science Institute. So you can see this sort of merger of serious scientific work with things that many people would say are not scientific even at a, at a very famous uh, university, uh, uh, Kyoto Imperial University. It, it's one of the, it's still around. It, 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 they just called Kyoto University today. Um, so even at an established institution like that, you had a sort of confusion about where to draw the line between science and superstition. So uh, meanwhile, works inspired by American writings on spiritualism appeared in Japan. The for example, the phenomenon of the spiritual, the theory of the all-powerful spirit, the mystery of spiritualism. Okay, and some other examples. So this this was big. This was big stuff in Japan. Many people were very interested in this, as they were, of course, in uh, other places around the world. So a key figure who attempted to merge science with spirituality was a guy called uh, Kuwabara Toshiro. And um, he founded the Society for the Study of the Spirit. And you see that word again, for, uh, Seishin. So for Kuwabara, that Seishin was a type of energy that lacked personality or, or individuality. And he believed that hypnotism could release the, the mind's power and cure disease. Okay, and of course, there are many people around who, who still believe that but uh, he took it very uh, seriously. Another important figure was Asano Wasaburo. Uh, he, 1934, he wrote Psychic Research and Its Direction. As you can see, very mystical. Uh, he founded Society for Scientific Research on Psychic Phenomena. So even in English, that word, you know, we use that word psychic. I mean, sometimes psychic might just mean psychological, but often psychic means someone who is in touch with the spirits. But in any case, the point being that psyche, psychic psychology, they all come from the, the same root. In the minds of many people, especially 100 years ago, there was no difference between psychology and psychic. So uh, Fukurai uh, Tomokichi, he tried to spiritualize the psychological. Uh, he wrote his dissertation on hypnotism, and he was also interested in abnormal clinical psychology. Um, he actually introduced William James into Japan. So a lot of these people uh, did a lot of important work translating uh, the works of Americans and European uh, researchers into Japanese. Uh, Fuk Fukurai wrote uh, Outline of Psychology of Hypnotism, The Psychology of Hypnotism, so again, just to remind, uh, remind us, we're talking about a, a vestige of bicameriality and the point I'm making, how important and how popular hypnotism was 
uh, as a phenomenon in Japan. Uh, Fukurai turned his attention to spiritualism and clairvoyance. He published uh, Clairvoyance and Photography and Spirit in a Mysterious World. So uh, photography, uh, I'm not very familiar with it, uh, but, but the idea is that you can project your thoughts onto a plate, onto a photographic plate, um, which is not really much scientific evidence for, but um, in any case, he believed the contents of the mind could be, pro as I just said, projected onto a dry plate of photographic film. And so this, that in Japanese, the word photography is nensha. And nen means to think. And if you look carefully, for those of you who are interested in Japanese ideograms, if you look carefully at the first uh, character, the bottom half is the word heart, right? So that's a clue to what it means, this idea that heart has something to do with one's thinking. Fukurai was criticized by colleagues who concluded that he was not practicing genuine science. Eventually he was forced to resign, but continued to pursue his interest in the paranormal. He was forced to resign from university. So among all the anomalous, anomalous phenomena, one stood out due to its ubiquity, of course, which was hypnosis. And uh, I think maybe we talked a little bit about hypnosis before, in these uh, meetings, but James has a whole chapter on hypnosis. And again, what's important about James, James makes an attempt to explain how does hypnosis as a process fit into what we know about the mind. As we know, hypnosis is practiced a lot, it, it's psychotherapy. Uh, we know a lot about hypnosis, but the strange thing about hypnosis is not really supposed to happen, but it, but it does. Um, and we, we, we don't, mainstream psychology does not ignore hypnosis anymore. It used to, but it has a hard time giving a theoretical account for how it's possible in the first place. Only James, to the best of my knowledge, comes up with a good theory of how hypnosis relates to ordinary consciousness. So early 20th century Japan, they experienced a hypnosis boom. You had these different groups coming together, Imperial Society for the Study of Hypnotism, Japanese Society for Hypnosis Philosophy, uh, training academies taught hypnotic methods and therapies. So it was a big deal in Japan. This is the word uh, hypnotism in uh, how you would write in Japanese, uh, sai mean jutsu. So sai means to induce, mean means sleep, and then jutsu means technique for. So of course, what we have to keep in mind, the metaphor of sleep for hypnosis is misleading because hypnosis is not a type of sleep, uh, even though many people sometimes uh, jump to that conclusion. <clears throat> so I think we have to ask the question, why this attention to hypnosis in the first decade of the 20th century in Japan well, I think it it's I think it has to do with as individuals became more and more consciously interiorized, concerns about features of what it meant to be a conscious being, such as self autonomy and self control, increased. And so again, that doesn't maybe it sounds a little vague, doesn't make much sense unless you know exactly what I mean by consciousness. But the point I'm making is people have a mistake, and some people have a mistaken view of what Jane's argued. They have this idea that 3000 years ago, a light switch went on and everyone became conscious. And that's not what Jane really argued. What he argued is that yes, consciousness developed about 3000 years ago, but it throughout history, certain features of it have been emphasized or stressed. And that <clears throat> especially during the 19th century, where we had massive changes all over the globe, consciousness had to become more intensified. Of course, this is something that, that I talked about at the beginning of the talk. So that this slide here, I think is important. And it's a little, maybe a little difficult to explain, <coughs> excuse me. So mystical phenomenon, uh, supernatural, spiritual, mystical healing practice, um, 
the cl clinical uh, recognized as therapeutic. I mean, a lot of people do recognize what we might call spiritual practices as, as having clinical value. Um, I think in the case of hypnosis, it does have a healing uh, value, but I don't necessarily think there's anything mystical about hypnosis. <clears throat> so what is hypnotism? Since I've been talking about it, I, I might as well talk about it, give a, a brief definition. It's a temporarily willed interruption of interiority or, or your conscious mind. Your mental space closes down. And in particular, your feeling of self-autonomy, which is a key feature of consciousness, is arrested, temporarily suspended. One voluntarily abdicates assumptions about self-control and suspends belief in metaphoric interiority. And that's basically what trancing is. So James pointed out why he was interested in hypnosis is why is it that not all, but most people can be hypnotized? I mean, it's not supposed to happen. And the point he made is that that must mean consciousness is not as deeply rooted as we think it is in human nature, that consciousness is a cultural invention. It's not something uh, evolved into human nature. It's not baked into human nature. Consciousness is something that we had to learn throughout history. And that explains why people are able to be hypnotized. So psychology, metaphysics, paranormal and psychic phenomena uh, were often used interchangeably in the late 19th century, as I pointed out. Um, spiritual events became serious research targets. I mean, there were, there were, there were some uh, Japanese researchers who tried to actually uh, debunk um, this sort of mix up of pseudoscience with serious science. Um, this is a little, this subject is a little bit different now, but in any case, Nakamura Kokyo, um, he was an important theorist of, of uh, what we would call the abnormal. He had a younger brother who was afflicted with a mental illness. Um, he opened up a private psychiatric clinic and he was a, he's important Nakamura because he was a critic of spiritualism and religious superstitions. He did, he did not think that, uh, being possessed by foxes or ghosts should be taken seriously. Uh, Nakamura established a semi-academic, uh, what was called the Japan Seishin Medical Society, 1902. Um, membership was not limited to doctors or psychologists, and uh, they attracted a variety of different speakers. So he really tried hard to uh, disentangle the study of mind from mysticism. So he edited, uh, I think it might still be around. I think it's maybe changed names. Uh, Abnormal Psychology from 1917. As I said, he attempted to take a scientific approach to psychotherapy. Uh, he wrote about the first case of multiple personality in Japan. He studied hypnotism and he introduced psychoanalytic theory in Japan. He translated Jung's On Psychic Energy in 1931. That's a whole nother talk actually about the uh, how different uh, psychiatric or psychological psychoanalytic traditions uh, were introduced and how they were received uh, into Japan. Um, psychoanalytic theory, I actually uh, did not, it had an impact, of course, um, but not as big as it did in the United States. Um, that, that, that's a whole nother uh, discussion. So this person here, to, to, I'm, I'm concluding with um, this guy here, actually, I'm sorry, I don't have his name. His, his name is um, Motara. Uh, he actually, in my book on the history of psychology in Japan, he gets one or two chapters. He, he's considered what we might call the father of Japanese psychology. And I'm not gonna talk about him today, obviously, but I, but in any case, I, I would I just show you his picture. He died very young, but he was very, very important, not just for the development of psychology as a research field in Japan, but as a social scientist. Um, in, in any case, uh, so 
again, so social changes, industrialization. So, so the, just kind of wrap up some of the key themes I've been talking about. So social changes such as industrialization modified psychological processes. That's the key point. So people may have a hard time with that because they assume that psychological processes are innate and that you can maybe change the content of the process, but you can't change the process itself. I'm making the argument that in fact, psychological processes do change. Uh, for example, they enhance, uh, an example would be enhanced conscious interiority. So in the 19th century, operations of the mind became a target of investigation. Uh, okay. So the field of psychology was more than just an investigation of the mental, of mental activity along secular and scientific lines in response to pressures of modernity. And actually, let me go back. So, you know, I mentioned the word industrialization. Keep in mind, industrialization is just one aspect of a whole host of changes in Japan that had to do with schooling. Remember, there was no widespread formal schooling in Japan, as was the case in many countries in the, in the mid late 19th century. So Japan, you know, to give an example of how psychological processes changed, a lot of that had to do with the introduction of formal schooling. Now that all everyone would have to be exposed to abstract knowledge. They would have to have their mental space expanded. They would have to learn uh, literacy and, and numeracy. Um, and this would increase abstraction, which of course makes people more consciously uh, interiorized. So I wanna emphasize that uh, we're talking about social changes in every facet of, of Japanese society. Uh, so, as I said, uh, we already talked about that. Um, so psychology revealed the workings of psyche. It ev evidenced, or was ev evidence of a transformation of the very psychological processes it claimed to be exploring. So that's, again, that's really my, I guess, my take home message. So psychology as a research field in its attempt to unveil uh, uh, not unveil, to, 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 yeah, I guess unveil the workings of the mind was really a, had to do with a transformation of the mind itself. Okay, that's something I think many people are probably not used to thinking about, right? Because we assume that the mind, the human mind, basically has not changed. But I believe, in the same way, social institutions change, our legal institutions change, our economics change. I think the human mind, uh, along with Jane's, also changes and is changing. I don't think the human mind, however you want to define it, is set in stone. So, conclusion, uh, well, in any case, uh, specific aspects of the toolkit of consciousness highlighted in the 19th century. Well, so these, th this list here, of course, this is, these are uh, just features more specific instances of what I mean by conscious interiority, mental spatialization, introception, self-narratization, individuation, self-reflexivity, self-autonomy, self-authorization. I mean, we, we can maybe talk about this later if people want examples, but I'm just, you know, it's a little bit abstract to say, well, Japanese became more conscious as other people did in the late 19th century. In order to make that a convincing argument, we have to come up with specific examples and we have to look at these features of consciousness um, to see how they increased in, uh, in the late 19th century Japan. So also it's important to keep in mind what is acceptable, especially today as scholarly inquiry, inquiry in the Euro-American uh, psychological tradition is similar in Japan. Okay, it's, it's, not, it's not as different as people might think. So Japanese, modern scientific Japanese uh, swept vestigial bicameriality, such as th things like hypnosis, spirit possession, under the rug of research. Well, that's not entirely true of hypnosis. Uh, that's not entirely true, but certainly spirit possession, it is. The idea, especially as far as the leadership of Japan was concerned, they wanted to be a modern 
powerful nation. And the last thing the leadership wanted was for foreigners to see Japanese as backward, superstitious, unscientific. So they really pushed this idea of modernizing the social sciences of Japan, including psychology. And as part of that, you, you, the idea is to get rid of superstitions like spirit possession. Uh, so these are just some uh, references um, that if anyone's interested, just contact me, I can send you these. But as I said, I, I wrote uh, this, this talk basically is very much expanded uh, in this book, if anyone's interested in a more detailed uh, analysis, a more detailed look at what I talked about. So um, I guess maybe I'll, uh, I'll end there if anyone has any uh, questions. Wonderful. Um, so excellent. So Brian, I had, I had a comment. Uh, so firstly, I really, really like this. Okay, because um, let, let, let me elaborate. Psychology is a very tough field. Uh, those psychologists don't believe it. It's like they think they have many of the answers, but actually it is a field in being born. You know, it's like there is a big growth that is happening and there is so much more to know. The only way to kind of navigate this field is to have some perspective on it, to see where it has been in the past, you know, how people have thought about psyche itself. So uh, in the past, and the point that you make of the fact that the human psyche is different, has changed over time. So there is a cultural evolution, cultural stages of development of human psyche. So this is a very difficult field to grapple with because there is a tendency in people just to take their current sensibility as given and look at all phenomena, historical, cross-cultural from that lens and impose that saying that that's what is going on over there. So to look at another time like James does of saying, what was the human psyche like, like in Sumeria before the cities uh, what, or, or, or when the cities fell? Or like you're doing of saying, what is it like in Japan now? And what has been the history of it in Japan? So to, I, mean, I find it fascinating what, what you're doing. You're looking at the development of concepts or development of concepts of psyche in Japan. And you're, you know, many people who are studying psychology are familiar only with the West. They're not familiar with the East. And you're kind of, showing the timeline of development in these. So, so I think this is a very, very um, critical exercise. And this is something that can produce really good results. Because as you were saying, any kind of deep observations of genes or anybody else or your own observations have to stand the test of data, which is coming from a very different source than what you're looking at. You can't just use like many uh, psychologists today do just college students acting now in five minute tests to form ideas about what psyche is. So you have to look at the entire time, entire uh, of earth and all the cultures in it to see if your theory holds true. So I think this effort of trying to do this, you know, to, trying to see uh, look at the chronology of ideas, develop, development of uh, psychological ideas in Japan and relate it to the ideas that you're talking about. I think it's a tremendous exercise and I definitely want you to do the second part to build build on this one. So I, I think it's, it's fantastic. Um, so, but we have covered a lot of ground today. Um, and I don't know where the audience is. Um, so, uh, many of you have been here listening to the concepts of Jane's before. Um, many of you may not be familiar with it. No questions are stupid questions. All questions are good. So you're welcome to ask questions. Um, I'm going to make just a couple of comments, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. So if you have questions, just go ahead and type a exclamation mark. 
try to keep it to questions because we want to get to, we want to explore as many different aspects of this topic as possible uh, and has, have as many questions answered. Um, so one point I do want to make is the main point that uh, Brian, you're making that the human psyche is different at different times. So there is the oral civilization before, in, before writing itself that has a certain character to it. And then with writing, the character is different. With the industrial revolution where um, literacy is widespread, the kind of psyche that develops is different. And that progression is different from diff for different people, maybe based on the script or maybe something else. Uh, so there is, so it's, so you have to be honest in trying to grasp what that other mind is. I'm not sure I can do it very well, but I know it needs to be done. So, um, so that's, that's kind of the overall uh, picture I'm on with. So any, any comments on the comments that I've made, uh, Brian? No, I, uh, of course, you know, I, I, I agree. Um, uh, the, the, yeah, the, so the, I think what should be highlighted, as, as you point out, is this assumption that many of us have that, well, this is how I feel. This is how I look at the world. The human mind is the same around the world. It's been the same throughout different periods of human history. It may look that way, but when you start to do very careful analysis and really do your homework and pay attention to the language, of course, you're going to find some commonalities, but you're going to find some differences too. The, the, and the further you go back in time, of course, the bigger those differences are going to be. Um, and I think it's, you know, I really put a lot of emphasis on the 19th century because I think because of, uh, especially industrialization, we had to learn to work. It really changed our species. And we're still, of course, experiencing these changes throughout post-industrialization, post-modern world. Um, and, but people have a hard time, you know, they, they, as I said, they assume that, well, people were the same. And uh, it, it, it's a politi politically, it's very uh, sensitive and a bit dangerous because, you know, to make a, the claim I'm making, because people assume that, I'm saying that people in the past were inferior or that, you know, the, the modern Western world should be the standard. And of course, that's not what I'm saying at all. So uh, I, I just want to mention that uh, I'm sure some people have some questions about that because, I, you know, it looks like a social Darwinist argument. I can see people will misinterpret this, that I'm saying that societies are uh, evolving and some societies are better than others. I'm not saying they're better than others. I'm saying they're more complex, but that's different from making a moral judgment. That's a very, uh, risk, that's the risky thing about talking about James because it's, in our political, politically correct environment, people are always looking to criticize you for uh, being politically incorrect. So, uh, you know, I just mentioned that. Sure, it's it's but uh, it's good to mention and good to ignore at this point. <laughs> truth is far more important than what you know people can how mis people can uh, misinterpret. Um, but the one point I want to add here is that while it is critical to understand, you know, understand, it is critical to be cognizant of this issue in understanding different cultures and different times. I want to give you a much more here and now example of how this applies. We have gone through very significant change in our lifetimes so of the people who are here. There was a time before television where reading and writing and books were a much larger part of a person's daily feed of what they did as opposed to the television world. There is a difference in sensibility. You kind, can kind of see it. Some people are whose base, whose sensibility is print sensibility, who are used to books, who are used to thinking in that way. And then there are people who have television sensibility who may not actually want to read a book, which is a big effort to them. They mm -hmm. want everything in that way. Okay, so there, and this is something that you can make observations on your own with the people that you know. Uh, and you can see that there is some difference in the way in which the psyche operates. So, I mean, Marshall McLuhan puts it very beautifully. 
We shape our tools and the tools shape us. So right. if you watch 10 hours of TV a day, there is a consequence on how your mind operates. If you read relentlessly, and if you write relentlessly, there is a consequence on how your mind operates, okay? Now to make things even more interesting and going into something that is happening now, which nobody, including me, has a good handle over, is look at the kids going up, growing up now with the cell phone in their hands, okay? The way their mind is operating and they are processing information is incredibly different from the TV generation, okay? I've, I've seen small kids handle that little thing like five-year-old, a seven-year-old and get more out of it than a really accomplished 50-year-old, okay? So there is something else that is going on. I don't know quite the shape of it. Right, it's there difficult is... to explain and to delineate, but you're, you're right, there is something going on. So you have, so you have these three examples. If you look at people around you, you can see that there are different sensibilities of people over time, depending on what media that they are using, how they are using their mind. I mean, they themselves are shaping it by using their mind. There is nothing stopping you from reading books. You know, there are always books that are still around. There's nothing stopping you from watching TV. There's nothing stopping you from, you know, using this and choosing the proportion in which to use it, how to use it. But the, if you use it in a certain way, there are, there are consequences of that. And that's what, and when you look at the culture like Brian is doing or James does on a large scale, what we are looking at large scale patterns of people in general, if they are watching TV, what happens? Mm -hmm. If they are integrated with the industrial uh, economy, what happens? What, there are individual variations. There are always individual variations. We are, what we are saying are general patterns at different times based on different conditions. Um, all right, uh, so let's open it up for questions. Uh, so folks, we have four rules. Type exclamation mark uh, in chat or raise your hand in Zoom in order to ask questions. Keep on topic, be brief, speak your mind, feel free to disagree with anybody on anything and do so courteously. Um, and let's keep it to questions right now because I want to get, get to as many questions as possible. So it's going to be Linda, Kevin, and Dave next. Linda. In the United States, we have a less than honorable history of how we treat the mentally ill. Uh, one period we had large mental institutions where people were basically warehoused and abused. Uh, what's the history of the treatment of mentally ill in Japan? Well, to answer that in a general way, I would say that it's probably not that much different mm -hmm. from what we saw in the United States. And it's not that much different from what we saw in Europe. So, you know, there, there is, uh, I think, a tendency um, you, you know, like the, the French philosopher Foucault, you know, people criticize him because he sort of uh, maybe a bit romanticized how the mentally ill were treated, that they were considered part of the village or something. But the, the, the truth, of course, was much, much uh, harsh, much more harsh. And so, um, is, you know, to answer your question, I think in general, uh, uh, I mean, the, the Japanese did not build mental institutions until much later, of course. Uh, but early on, um, they, uh, I don't think you'd find too much uh, difference, actually. Thank you. Next up is Kevin, Dave, and Francoise. Kevin. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you, Brian. Uh, another meeting, uh, Prince Tyson. I'm mainly using on your slides, uh, mentioning that uh, is psycholo uh, psychology and metaphysics, uh, paranormal, I uh, say, uh, phenomena are usually interchangeable in the 19th century. Yes. It's still the case now. And, and the following question, what is the language shape our mind and the psyche? It's, uh, for me, it's we make, when we use, make new term, we've got our own term, then a connection between it. Thank you. Okay, so the your first point, um, your first question, um, you, you know, this, this sort of overlap of what we might call metaphysics and uh, 
modern re research uh, psychology. So I, I think what we have to keep in mind is that people who are academics, you know, PhD credentialed people, they're going to make a very clean break between superstition and uh, science in their research, because if they don't, they're not going to be able to climb the academic ladder. However, at the same time, uh, I think there are a lot of people um, who are not necessarily trained in academics, who perhaps are a little more open to accepting this sort of gray area between metaphysics and modern uh, research psychology. Uh, and I'm so, Kevin, I'm sorry, what was the, your second? Uh... Uh, the second question, the best way I can paraphrase it is how does your language shape your thinking and psyche? So uh, that, of course, really is the key point of what James argued in his book. Uh, the idea is that if you don't have certain words to describe certain features of consciousness, if you don't have a vocabulary that describes something happening in your head, uh, you're not going. You're, you're not going to have consciousness, and uh, so that's the the that, that's really the easiest way to answer it. I and also when you look at languages, each language is going to be a bit different. Some languages are going will have. If you look at the psycho the, the psychological vocabulary of a language. Some languages may have more thinking words. Some languages may have more emotion words. Uh, some languages in some ways may be more subtle, more nuanced when they try to explain psychic uh, phenomena or, or, or mental uh, phenomena. Um, but the only way to find that out is to actually look at the language. Uh, so uh, no two languages are exactly alike when it comes to describing psychological phenomena. There are some basic commonalities, I suppose, but, you know, for example, the word, all those expressions with the key in Japanese, there's really no good translation. And we can translate those words, the expressions using key, but there's no real literal uh, English translation that makes sense. So uh, language does make a very big difference. But the problem is the difference is that language, how languages impacts the way our psychology works. It's like technology. It's not always obvious. It's very subtle. And sometimes the differences don't make sense unless you look at things over a long historical period, or you do a very fine-grained study. And for example, study carefully uh, a language. You know, when you have a good methodology, then you're more likely to see these uh, differences, how language does uh, shape the way we um, process information. So Brian, I mean, this is a key theme. So let me spend a couple more minutes on it. Um, I was watching this video by the author Leonard Schlein. He's written a book called The Alphabet and the Goddess. And he was describing the difference between the oral culture and literate culture, especially with the invention of the Greek alphabet. What he was saying is that when you're listening to somebody, when you're hearing, hearing somebody or speaking, you have this multi-sensory input. So you can watch my expressions. You can see here the tone uh, and the words are part of all of that. Now, fast forward to alphabet when you're reading. So what, what, what happens is that when you're hearing somebody both your kind of right hemisphere, which is good at seeing patterns, and your left hemisphere, which is going kind of in a serial way, is are kind of working together, are engaged together. When you are reading something, okay, especially with the alphabet, you are going linearly. And imagine like if you kept going linearly, kept going linearly, you are actually using that sequential part of your brain more. And his argument is that that actually changes what you end up doing, what you end up focusing on. So you are kind of by, it's like, it's like exercising, right? So suppose you walked a lot, then your leg muscles are going to get stronger. So what mm -hmm. he's saying is that by moving to the alphabet and reading and writing relentlessly, you are 
increasing the power of your left hemisphere operations, certain kind of operations of sequential operations, time-based operations, as opposed to holistic, big picture, um, kind of vague ground, you know, background uh, sense sensing operations, whereas uh, the left brain is much more kind of focused and saying, this is what is important right now. So it, it kind of changes the mix of what, the, what your psyche is doing when you move from the oral culture to the literate culture. So any, any thoughts about that? Yes, I, you know, of course, I, I think you're right. I, I, so I think what happens when you have an alphabet, people uh, begin, they're, they're, so many things change with an alphabet. It allows a society to organize more information, to store information in the same way that in the Neolithic period, people learn to store food and that changed the social structure. It's the same thing with information. If we can store information and put it away and it's more accessible, we're gonna be able to plan for the future. We're gonna be able to narrate ourselves on a longer timeline. Um, and so what, what's going on, it's not just a matter of a change within the individual mind. It's also changes in the society in general that impacts economics, that impacts uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, production of, of tools, whatever. Uh, it impacts politics. In, in, you know, so every, every facet of society is impacted because of this uh, change in the human mind. And so, uh, but you know, the, the problem is these changes can happen uh, historically, relatively speaking, it, it looks slow. And sometimes things don't make sense historically, unless you look at things long range. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's, the, that's the challenge with everything we're talking about is you have to do both fine grain studies of a language, but you also have to step back and do big history. And then you begin to see these patterns. And, you know, I've, I mentioned this before related to this, the idea of the future of, of a utopian future is actually a new idea. Uh, you know, it's only a couple hundred years old. I mean, people in the middle ages had an idea of utopian heaven or a utopia uh, somewhere else. But a couple hundred years ago, people started to have this idea that we can build a utopia in this world. And the way to do that is through better planning. And I think that's a result. It took centuries to unfold, but that's a result of this more linear way of thinking and planning. Wonderful. Uh, Dave, what's your question? Yeah, wonderful presentation, Brian. Uh, what occurred to me, you know, we talk about industrialization, making large changes in Japan as, as well as the rest of the world. It seems to me it was really a big change in a person's life that I think might have some explanation about us starting to talk about psychology. You know, before that, People were pretty much uh, tied to the land, farming, and, and to their family. Uh, a father and son would probably operate the land together, and the father would teach the son, you know, when, when you plant and when to harvest and all the things. And, of course, the only book in the house might be the Bible, but you know, there's not emphasis on that. Uh, and if you had a problem, you'd go talk to your father or, you, or maybe to the priest in the village. Uh, but you're all pretty well tied to this area and, and you knew everyone. But then with industrialization, you're ripped away from that. You go to the big city. Uh, the, your father's replaced by the boss in the factory who's not nearly as understanding. There's a lot more pressure you're gonna be working, what, 10, 12 hours a day, not just occasional work in the spring and the fall. And you get this pressure and there's, you know, who do you turn to and uh, when I have anxiety, depression, to me, that's a big part of this change. Your comment? Yeah, you, yeah. I mean, you, you touched upon a lot of things. Um, and I think in general, of course, you're right. So industrialization, 
uh, and not, not just the United States, but of course in, in any society where they start to industrialize the past 150, 200 years, there are so many changes. And a lot of these changes may be directly or indirectly related to changes in what we might call psychological processes. So some of those changes are easy to discern, but for, uh, you know, for, for example, you, you mentioned um, the family, the kinship structure, because of industrialization, it shrunk and be became uh, the, the nuclear family was invented and people did not have to rely on an extended kinship uh, network. Schooling, of course, you cannot run an industrialized society unless you have the masses, most of the people getting some sort of schooling. And that schooling is going to change the way people process information. You're going to learn about math. You're going to learn about other cultures. You're going to um, expand your mental horizons. Uh, and of course, the trick from an academic point of view is to be specific. And what does that mean exactly? But uh, certainly, uh, the, 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 the psychology of the individual um, uh, must have changed because of industrialization. You know, th this whole idea of agricultural lifestyle, you, you know, my uh, grandmother came from uh, my late grandmother came from Ireland and she she was very uh, there were a lot of agricultural things about her I mean she wasn't sure when her birthday was um, same thing with my mother-in-law my late mother-in-law came from a, a agricultural background and if you watch TV shows in America in the 1960s a lot of them have agricultural themes you know things like uh, hee haw or uh, Petty, what is it? Petticoat Junction. I mean, shows that seem so silly today, but so much of American pop culture was inspired by uh, a, a view of life as as living on the farm. So these these changes may seem far away, but actually, we're still undergoing a lot of these changes from a more of an agricultural lifestyle to uh, industrialized, post-industrialized lifestyle. And as I said. Uh, you're going, it, it, it changes the life cycle of the individual. Um, you're going to not rely on your family as much anymore. You're going to have to rely basically on the state and the government and strangers. You, so that must in some way impact and configure uh, a person's psychology. So Dave, that was a fantastic observation. I think, I think that's, that's really core to thinking about this because you can't really understand uh, changes uh, separately as individual changes. You have to look at kind of large changes. And I think 19th century, um, the impact of that was humongous because before that, life of a grandfather was not that different from life of a grandchild. There was a continuity. So things didn't change much. So there was a sense that human beings are fixed. That's all they are there wasn't much travel. So you were, didn't move that far away from where you, you grew up. And all of that kind of sense, there is a kind of a static view of human beings, which is different from different places. And for each of those views, there is such a long history in culture, cultural history in that place that that provides um, a base. And you can see, the impact of 19th century in so many different dimensions. So one of my favorite things is language. So I have a dictionary of uh, idioms of English and they date all the idioms. And when you turn page after page, there is an explosion of idioms in the 19th century. So it is the language trying to grapple mm -hmm. with what is going on. So you have to use new words to right. capture a phenomena that has never been before. Right. Uh, so that's that's a huge. So thank you, uh, Dave, for, for bringing that up. Next up is going to be Francoise, Mike, and Olga. Francoise. Um, hi. Well, thank you, Brian, because I followed with a lot of interest the, the history of psychology in uh, Japan. And from what I have understood, you said that there was, um, they developed in kind of uh, si very similar ways. 
And as they develop uh, similarly, was there any influence on each other? You know, because besides the industrialization, it was also the time of the opening to the, to the East, the time of the World Fair. So was there interaction between the East and the West, uh, you know, the Euro-American, uh, the Western psychology and the Japanese psychology? That, that's a good question. And to, so to try and answer it, uh, there definitely was uh, a very international sense and international community of Japanese researchers, European and American uh, psychologists. And of course, that was disrupted because of the war. But, uh, you know, many people might assume that, well, the first Japanese psychologist in the late 1800s must have been focused just on what it means to be Japanese. But actually, they didn't. They had a very universal, a very cosmopolitan view of what it meant to be a person. Of course, that would change in the 1930s and 40s because of the, the dictatorship. But um, th there, was a, th th there was a lot more interaction. You know, this is pre-internet times. And yet there was a tremendous amount of interaction. People would go to, Japanese would come to America or go to Europe for training or conferences. You did have some Westerners go to Japan. Um, to teach and, and to, to train Japanese, uh, perhaps to live there. Uh, but it was definitely uh, a, a lot of interaction, more than people might think these days. Wonderful. I just want to comment on this. You know, I, I always like to um, drum up uh, the reputation of New York. So in New York, for example, there is a street um, in uh, East Village where there is a lot of Japanese, young Japanese have come. So there is actually a cultural exchange and I've talked to many of them. And it's very interesting. Like they intend to actually go back to Japan, like unlike most other immigrants who come here, but they are here because, and they're very, very honest about it. They're saying, look, I love Japan. I want to be there, but there are things that we need to learn. We need to learn how to interact with the world better kind of because we are kind of more inward thinking. We have to do that and we have to do that while being Japanese. So I'm here for the next three, four years to go to school here and I'm going to try to learn how to do that. So in, in their own way, like I have heard like at least 10 different people tell me, tell me that, which is very incredible, which is, which is exactly what needs to happen, mm -hmm. uh, both, both for our sake and, and their sake. Right. Um, Next up is um, Mike, Olga, and Rajin. Mike, what's your question? Okay, we, um, we've had the conversation before that civil, civilization and consciousness are driven by language. Um, even though most of the people in those uh, groups were illiterate, but by example, uh, they got uh, driven. Even um, uh, the pets and farm animals and even the wild rats uh, benefited from uh, civilization. Now, uh, the Japanese one is, uh, in the context that we've been talking about today, uh, we've talked about this in the other context, but in the context we're talking about today, the Japanese language is a pictorial language. Um, and the um, uh, other alphabetic languages were um, read right to left and the Greek and had no vowels. The Greek language uh, brought in vowels and left to right. Uh, did these different modalities of languages have a differing effect on that you've noticed or that you've observed or, uh, or can comment on uh, as to how language has affected civilization and the types of civilization we've um, we've observed. So yeah, so many people describe uh, Japanese or Chinese as being pictorial, but strictly they're not really uh, pictorial. Um, I, I think the better uh, description is uh, ideograms, and so if you look at an ideogram, you might be able to find a pictorial element 
you know, I'm trying to think of an easy example. So the, the ideogram for a person, you know, it, it sort of goes like this. If you could draw it, it'd be like this, like this, just two lines. It looks like a man walking or the, the word for big. It's a line across, a line this way, a line that way. It looks like someone going like this trying to use their arms or hands and it's big so there, there is a pictorial aspect to it but not in the way many people think there are many ideograms that you can't really tell what the original pictorial element was and also japanese actually unlike chinese it does have a phonetic uh, uh aspect to it because japanese has three writing systems it has the ideograms which were borrowed from china and then it has two syllabaries, which are phonetic. Um, so in any case, uh, you know, just to make things a little more uh, complicated uh, about um, uh, what's the act, what the actual nature of uh, the Japanese language is. D does that answer your question? Well, um, it it, uh, it does, but uh, these uh, how, how do you visualize the effects going? Even though the bulk of the people at any given stage were illiterate, even though now that's not true, how did that influence the society? Even uh, even though the uh, uh, it wasn't why most people couldn't write when the when when the civilization uh, made its ma major strides. Yes. Yeah, so, of course, before the 19th century, probably most people around the world were not literate. Uh, in the case of Japan, that was generally true also, though you did have some, the, 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 you did have uh, a fair amount of people in Japan probably who um, were not elite, but they could read and write some Japanese. But yes, I mean, most of the information that was transmitted was uh, was done orally, uh, and again, but there's nothing there's nothing really special about Japan in that regard. As I said, in fact, these days most languages there's at least several thousand human languages are not written down. There's actually a, only a small number of human languages that have been put into uh, literate form. So, um, but in any case, I I, I think that. Um, uh, it, it does, it does, in, as we were talking before, you know, Shrikant brought this up, it does make a difference if a society is more oral based or more literate based. But remember, in any of these societies, you're always going to have an elite strata. For example, the samurai in Japan, who probably were literate, uh, most of them. So uh, you will have uh, an important you know, layer of people who control the economic resources, make political uh, decisions, control the, the 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 cultural traditions that are transmitted down, who were literate. So, so literacy uh, still played a very important role. Wonderful. I just want to add. Uh, you know, Marlin Donald makes this point very well. You know, he puts it in terms of external memory. You know, this writing is basically a way of externalizing your memory. And even if a small percentage of people are doing that, those are the people who are actually making possible a much more larger economic activity, much more complex economical activity, much more long range. And what that happens is that they change the system. So even if there are people who do not use external memory, their life is profoundly impacted it's still by impacted, that. Yeah. So yes, even absolutely. if, like, for example, growth of cities in order to do uh, kind of build a large economic enterprise of a city, you need the, the literacy. But the city is going to need food that can be produced by people who doesn't, even if they know literacy. That, that's another interesting point. I was reading uh, Eric um, uh, Havelock. His point is that there is a difference between the rural and urban culture even today. Because mm. if you're a farmer, right, what are you doing? You are, you are able to do most of the things. You're not following manuals. You're learning from your dad what needs to be done in order to bring up the crop. And you are doing what needs to be done. 
And it's all part of the oral tradition. Even if you are writing, even if you can read and write, most of the work that you're doing doesn't require uh, your reading and writing. You're, it's being transmitted and used in the very similar to the old uh, tradition. But if you are an accountant or a lawyer in a city, then of course you have to use the externalized tools, externalized memory or writing in, in order to function. And that's kind of the inter integrated part of, of your system. Mm -hmm. Next up is Olga followed by Jeff. Olga. Okay. Hi. Thank you very much. You're, I already attend probably, I'm not sure how many presentations I uh, attended, but it's uh, all extremely exciting. Thank you very much. I uh, first would like to make a small comment. And um, Linda asked about mental institutions in Japan and here in the United States. I don't know so much about United States, only from Ken Kesey flying over cook, the cuckoo nest, mostly my knowledge of what was going on in United States. But I know that these um, most expensive female artist, Kusama, you could uh, Google her. She is most ex uh, expensive, a famous uh, artist, uh, Japanese, Kusama, who uh, checked her, herself uh, in mental institution and still lives there. Mm. It's much more convenient to her. You could uh, read about her online. It's very easy to find. And a couple of days ago, there was a birthday of a writer, European writer, who became, now became more and more famous, Robert Weiser, who, who, um, uh, who lived in, um, uh, in uh, who lived in 19th and 20th century, he, he in Europe he also midlife checked himself in mental institution and lived there. So European mental institutions are really different from what is explained in uh, who was described in uh, fly, uh, by Ken Kesey. So, uh, so, and now I heard that some American psychologists and psychiatrists starting to say, oh, it was much better when people could uh, um, uh, spend uh, time in mental institution and really get better. And now we just give them medication and throw them in two weeks from the hospital. Thank so, you. It's a very complex question, but I would like first my, my question to, uh, to Brian is what is now it's like in United States where it's all this psychotherapy um, uh, model when uh, it's like already a controlling institution when a lot of people almost all go to psychotherapists instead of talking to their friends and families and um, uh, uh, Olga, could you some could you and ask the one, one more small, small, small question? And this um, uh, intergenerational gap, how big it's in Japan? It's uh, bigger than in United States. They uh, parents and kids already don't talk anymore and don't like uh, have this. So, so what's in Japan? There is. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank yes. you. Uh, let let Brian answer the question, Olga. Okay. Uh, so Brian, yeah, go ahead. So, yeah. So uh, your your question and comments are actually uh, important, but they're they're. It, what, what you're talking about is something extremely complex. Um, and so, I mean, just to take a stab at it, as you probably know, in the case of America, uh, beginning after the war in 1960s or so, um, the, 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 the philosophy was to do away with mental institutions because mental institutions were associated with uh, barbaric treatment of patients. Um, and so the idea was that mental patients should be taken care of uh, in the local community, that they should be 
um, that, that the family should try and help them. And, and so, you know, there, there's, there's, I don't want to say one way is better than the other, because it really depends on the individual, uh, what the individual needs. Um, one thing you seem to say that uh, I, I think is important is that the idea now in America is just to give uh, a mental patient uh, drugs to med medicate them. And, uh, you know, again, it's a complex thing. For some people, medication is needed. For other people, they're probably over-medicated. It's, uh, it's certainly not a good idea. I mean, I am a mental health counselor. So when someone comes to see me, I can't prescribe medications, but I, I always talk about it. If someone comes to see me, you know, I, if it's a severe mental health issue, I always say, at least talk to a psychiatrist if you think that you need it. But, um, uh, you know, and then there are other patients who clearly just need talk therapy. So it really depends on the individual. Uh, so there's, there's really no easy way to answer uh, your question, but it's very important, I think, for how a society treats uh, victims uh, of mental uh, illness. Uh, Brian, do you have any comment about the, uh, the way in which intergenerational uh, relationships work in Japan versus America? So when I was in Japan, when I first went to Japan back in the 1980s, there was a word, um, shinjin rui, which means something like a new type of human being. And older Japanese, middle-aged older Japanese used to refer to young people as shinjin rui, as if they were an alien type of species, because they could not really communicate with them. Um, again, I don't think that's anything unique to Japan. You find that in all societies. However, I would say that in a society that was changing very rapidly, as Japan was after the war, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, uh, that the, there will be more of a, a, a gap or a rift between generations. Um, but we see that in America too, you know, so it's a little bit difficult to say, um, to characterize an entire society. Uh, but but there is definitely something to that, this idea in Japan that young people are just changing too fast and the older generation cannot keep up with them. Thank you. Next up is Jeff, followed by Mike. Jeff. Brian, your presentations are so intriguing. Um, so I, I just can't resist asking, you know, in the overall scheme of sort of the, the evolution or adaptation of the human mind um, and psyche, um, you know, and this might be an unfair question, but uh, given, for example, um, you know, a little bit what we were saying here, how, you know, writing advanced and reading and literacy advanced slowly across the globe. But everybody that I talk to around the world with regard to smartphones, um, not only you know, does everybody I know have one, but they're trying to um, bring them to everywhere in rural areas on countries in every continent of the world where, you know, where everybody will be able to see and create videos and have the internet right in their hand and do Zoom calls with people around the entire world in a moment and do commerce and and vote and, and create videos and art and pictures and, and that people are doing more writing and reading even if it's only 144 characters at a, 140 characters at a time. Nobody has ever been writing and reading so much throughout the world um, as well as, as talking to each other. So it seems like we're probably on the cusp of something here mm -hmm. where if we look back 10, 20, 30 years from now, or maybe, you know, not so far away, we could say, here's something that happened there that really was a turning point and had an impact on the human psyche. So I know it's a little unfair to ask, but do you have any guesses as to what that might be? Um, no, I, I don't, but you know, that's a very, it's a, those are fascinating uh, it's a fascinating topic you brought up because I, I often do wonder about it. I, 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 I definitely agree that we are changing faster as a species. And I think basically beginning in the 18th, 19th century, that's what modernity was all about. Things started to speed up and things are even going faster now. So there's this idea of speed. 
what or what that's going to do to us or how it's going to do something to us. Of course, I don't know, but I, I do certainly, you know, I love sci, I love science fiction and so much of science fiction is dystopian. And another theme of science fiction is, is uh, what capitalism and commercialism are going to be like. And it's not just about what technology does to us. It's about uh, what economic exchanges do to us as they, as they speed up. So what you're talking about, being able to pick up a phone and order things with Amazon and all this, th that type of economic exchange, what's different now, it's instantaneous. It's so quick. And that somehow is going to impact us. And so, you know, what I, the way I look at it, I look at the human psyche. I look at what's going on economically and uh, what this is doing to the social fabric. It, so the, these interactions are so unpredictable. I think that there's some good things, of course. It's so fun to order a book from Amazon and get it a few days later. But I also think, again, to go by, back to science fiction, there's definitely some something dystopian about this because our these this is a topic for a whole nother talk, but our desire, what happens when our desires are instantaneously satisfied all the time? I think that's a danger. And I think that's the problem with some futurist writing. They just look at the technology but we are still human beings with desires and values. We're still imperfect and all the technology in the world is not going to change that imperfect sense of being a, a human. So in any case, that's my stab at it. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, folks, I'm going to put in chat um, a playlist that we are doing with uh, Center for the Study of Digital Life, which is focused essentially on this, this issue. Um, and I, I invite you to go ahead and watch those videos. Um, next up is going to be Mike. Mike, go ahead. Thank you for bringing uh, so many profound viewpoints to us. Uh, uh, the, the comment about uh, that Olga made about uh, um, people in, uh, with different uh, than neurotypical viewpoints bringing um, uh, artistic or creative uh, material to the world uh, is well taken. And, um, the, and there's a number of people who try to, uh, normal people who try to get on drugs, DMT and ayahuasca, and, um, and, and worse than that, to, non, uh, to uh, produce their creative art, which, um, uh, not that I recommend it, but that uh, seems to have been a, a, a positive viewpoint in some respects. So um, uh, uh, that uh, that's that's brought out a number of ideas to me. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so Brian, I think this this was fantastic meetup. Uh, what I would like to do is, uh, I think we're running a little late, so let's not do breakout rooms because I think um, people got a chance to ask lots of questions, which is good. Um, and I would definitely want you to do the second part. Uh, would you be able to do it next time? Well, actually, there is no second part to this. Oh, okay. I, I said that maybe we should divide this one. However, there is there is something that I, I have in mind that I, I could... Um, I could certainly elaborate on. Right. On, so on let's do one thing. Let's plan on you doing the next Saturday. Okay. I will work with Bill to figure something out because I think the your this series that you're doing is extremely valuable, okay. and I, I want to continue doing that. And we'll I'll add Bill somewhere else. Uh, we'll we'll figure out uh, that. Okay. All right. Sure. Wonderful. All right. Uh, so. So thank you very much, Brian. This was fantastic as always. 